Well, good morning, Spratt Church. I hope you're doing well. I know most of you are at home. I'm going to tell you a quick joke, and then we're going to do the lighting of the candles. Two people were standing next to each other, and one was named Amanda. And Amanda said, what's the difference between Santa's reindeer and a knight in shining armor? And Robert said, I don't know. What's the difference? Amanda says, one slays dragons, and the other's dragon slays. But um bum All right. It's a little weird telling jokes and, and having only one or two people laugh, and one shaking their head at me. <laughs> Um, uh, we'll do the lighting of the candles now. The reading today is Isaiah 64, 1 to 9. If ever there was a year we needed Advent, this is the year. We hardly know how to describe the year we have lived through. We hesitate to reflect on all the mess around us in 2020. All we know is that nothing seems right. Nothing seems like it used to be. Nothing. We need Advent. The prophet Isaiah cried out for us. Oh, that you would tear down the heavens and come down to make your name known so that nations might tremble at your presence. So tear through the mess, O oh Lord, and come down to us again. We long to be your people, a people of hope. We light this first candle as a sign of our hope. Hope that you can meet us, even in the mess of our world. Hope that you can still see us, even though we feel we are lost in the rubble. Let this light be the guide that brings us to Emmanuel once more. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. And I pray that uh, the week is, is good to you both. <clears throat> the announcements I have for today are pretty much the same as they are last week. They're a little bit advanced on, on the time scale. Um, we are starting the uh, Christmas Bible study. Uh, it will be Wednesday at 7.30 on Zoom. Uh, it leads me to a little bit of a conundrum because I don't know who is going to be uh, needing the Zoom. Uh, we need to, I need to get a phone call from you uh, to make sure that I know who is going to be part of the, uh, the Zoom. If you've got a book, please give me a phone call. I would say text me or email me, but those are always more troubled ways to get a hold of me, so I would prefer that you give me a phone call. Um, that being said, the books are a free will donation. That does, means that you don't have to pay for them, but if you want to alleviate the church some cost of the books, we would ask that you pay the, pay the price of the book, or at least some price of the book, which is $8. Um, <clears throat> so I will need a list of all who will join. Uh, that being said, also know that uh, at 6.30 on Wednesday, I'll be doing the Pastor Reads a Bedtime Story. We'll be doing the first one. Uh, it'll be uh, Charlie Brown Christmas. Uh, it should be just a fun story to read. Uh, not every story that I read will be necessarily uh, based off of the Bible, but it will be fun in some way. <clears throat> and we will relate it to the Bible in some way. That being said, don't forget about your offering. If you have offering, please, you can bring it in <clears throat> uh, if you want, if you can get into the church. I wouldn't leave it in the 
the container outside of church, that would be a bad idea. But if you want to mail it, <coughs> excuse me, if you want to mail it, um, you can mail it to the church. It's going to be at the uh, church street address, no longer the box address. Um, I don't have that ver that right in front of me right now. But if you do mail it to the box address, I'm sure they're going to forward it to the street at least for a little while. I think we've done a forwarding on that. So um, I will get the street address to you and we'll make sure that it gets posted on the, the Facebook page. Um, if I haven't said it yet, I am doing the Pastor Reads a Bedtime Story at 6.30 on Wednesday. It'll be on my page on the Facebook. Um, we are doing the virtual Sunday school next Sunday at 10 a.m. We did it this morning. Um, there are packets that go with that. If you want to join in and you want a packet, get, get a hold of Cindy. Cindy will be able to uh, get the packets to you. I know we're doing it on the Advent. Uh, <clears throat> also, the last thing that I have, and I mentioned it last week, is January I'd like to start my sermons on the movies. And um, <clears throat> the first Sunday after, the first Sunday in January, I'm going to be on vacation. And Pastor Eric, who you probably know uh, because he was here last time, will be uh, doing the sermon then. Uh, but the following four Sundays, which would lead us actually into February a little bit, uh, will be based off the movies. And somebody had suggested the Chronicle, the first movie of the Chronicles of Narnia, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, uh, which I think is a fine idea. Uh, we'll do that the very first Sunday. Uh, but that means we've got three more movies that need to be picked. And I had made suggestions of different genres that we could pick from. Um, the only two things is, is that we don't want the movies too adult oriented. Uh, not a lot of violence, not a lot of drugs, not a lot of any of the things that are content that we would shy away from the kids to see. Um, and, and definitely, if you even go a little further than that, because some people will let their kids see about anything. And uh, we just want to be very family friendly on this. Uh, on the other side, though, we don't want to have it so child friendly that the adults can't uh, enjoy it as well. So no SpongeBob SquarePants, um, no, nothing that's too, too kid, kid friendly. We want to have something that if it is a cartoon or something along that line, that it's something that a adult can wrap their head around as well. So, uh, that being said, those are really the only two restrictions that I have. They don't have to be Christian movies at this point, since we've picked out our Christian movie, uh, but that doesn't mean that can't be true, too. So just uh, if you have some, if I don't get any ideas, I will pick the movies. And um, and I'll pick on things that I, I enjoy. Uh, you may not enjoy as much. Uh, but I, I do like the challenge. So if you want to challenge me, uh, those are the things that that need to be thought of when doing that. <clears throat> the prayer requests that we have this week, I will make sure I do a prayer, one call, tell all for the prayer requests. I didn't do any last week because the only prayer request that was added was uh, the people's first names and we didn't know their last names and I wasn't sure if uh, that would make sense to people or not. Uh, but we And it was Thanksgiving. So uh, we will do a one call, tell all for prayer requests this week. Um, and that being said, we do have some prayers that we should be giving up at this time, of course, for our government, uh, of course, for those that are coming down with the virus. We're hitting a point where we're getting 200,000 or, yeah, that a day uh, for uh, new cases, uh, and that's just a horrendously not high amount and we're we're just people are it, it's said on the news that people that weren't affected by it that didn't know anybody before 
now are saying they're knowing people that have had this virus. So we've had it around long enough that we're starting to see that it's how close it really is. And here at Spratt, we understand how close it, it could be and it could be closer. So we need to be careful. And I pray that you be careful throughout the week, but I also ask that you pray for those that are, are having it and those that are recovering from it. Um, we heard on the news this last week, or I did, of people that were in the, the lines for the food pantries and that were trying to find food for Thanksgiving and people that were needing food. It speaks a lot to what's the situation that's going on, and we need to keep those people in our prayer. And also in the news, they talked about turning off the power out west to people that uh, were close to the fires that are going on there, and people went Thanksgiving without any power. And that was to do to, to help control the the fire, the flames that were already there, the power company didn't want to be blamed for worsening the situation. So there's a lot to be in prayer for this week, and we need to pray for our president and president-elect as well. We ask that uh, you all bow your heads with me at this time. Dear Lord, I thank you for your presence in this time. I thank you for the fact that we are finally in this season of Advent that we can hopefully make it through and, and see through to the end where we can finally say that 2020 is a thing of a past. And like we said last week with the virus, that there, the light is coming, the end of the tunnel is, is getting closer. And though it's not here yet, we know that we just need to be diligent a little while longer. We ask that you be with us during this time for those of us that are so virus weary. We ask that you be with those people that are, are dealing with the virus in different ways and, and people that are lo having permanent senses of loss of taste and smell and how crippling that is for, for them. We ask that you be with those that are dealing with the the secondary effects of the virus, which is the impact on our economy and people that are out of jobs and needing work and just needing food. We ask that you be with those that are dealing with the fire and, and having to go without power. We ask that you be with those in our government that are dealing with knowing what the right thing to do is and, and doing the appropriate thing. We ask that you be with all of us at this time, that we not forget who you are. I thank you, dear Lord, in your name. Amen. Now, in the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The scripture reading we have for this morning is, as Mickey said, the scripture is Isaiah 64, 1 through 9. <clears throat> And it may sound a little different to be saying some of the things that are here, and it just doesn't sound very Christmassy. But as we go through the sermon, we will find out that at one time Christmas didn't sound very Christmassy. There was the expectations, but not the, the reality yet. But verse 1 and through 9 goes, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you. As when the fire sets twigs ablaze and cause water to boil, come down and make your names known to your enemies and cause the nations to quake before you. For when you did awesome things we, that we did not expect, you came down and the mountains trembled before you. 
Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ears have perceived, and no eyes have seen any God beside you, who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. You come to help of those who gladly do right, who remember your ways, but then can continue to sin against them. You were angry. How then can we be saved? All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all of our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and the wind of and our, and like the wind, our sins are swept away. No one calls on your name or strives to lay a hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have given us over to your sins our sins. Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay, and you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be angry beyond measure, Lord. Do not remember our sins forever. O oh, look on us as we pray, for we are all your people. This is the word of God for the people of God. I'm speaking to you about the first Sunday of Advent. Jesus hasn't been born yet, but hope springs eternal. And in thinking about this sermon, I had an incident this week, and it's a story about my cat, Luke, and I know you guys love to hear about Luke, my cat. And those of you that may know him and have seen him, you know that Luke is a large size cat, 26 pounds, which is big even for Luke. He's been on a diet and he <clears throat> struggles with me to try to communicate the hunger that I know that he has, uh, but I have to keep food from him. So occasionally he he will lay down and and fall asleep to wait for the time to eat, and he knows when that is. But occasionally he'll get up and he will get on my chest and he will just meow. And if you know anything else about my cat is that he's not a quiet meower. He's a loud meower. And he will get up and on my face only about that far away and just meow at me and say, is it time to eat yet? And he springs of hope eternal when he says that. But he also springs of a mouthful of bacteria and the smell can just wrinkle your ears. He is also smelly <laughs> in his breath. But he is so hopeful that the next moment, just with one meow, that he is going to get what he wants from me, and he knows that I'm the one that's going to get him his food. In the sermon and in these scriptures, we don't start off with something that sounds like it's very Christmassy. We don't hear those words that were familiar to, so familiar to hear, the shepherds, the angels, the the the. Bethlehem and all of those things, they're not found in this verse of Isaiah. And indeed, it's not even a verse of prophecy so much as, as just a, a, a lament of what's going on in the situation. Contrary to the, the manner in which is often celebrated in the church, the Advent begins and not on a note of joy, but despair. 
Humankind has reached the end of its rope, and in terms of our Bible, there has been 400 years of silence. That's the, the Protestant Bible. We don't have any record of what's happened from 400 B.C. to the point of Jesus' coming. In the Catholic Bible, there is books that that cover some of that time, the Maccabeans and the revolt that they had to deal with. And, and we know that the coming, the, the, uh, some of the traditions that the Jewish people have for their celebration comes from that time of, of that 400 years. But in the Christian Protestant sense, we don't share any of that information amongst our people. We don't, we don't recognize the books that, that fill in that time as, as appropriate for our Bible. They call it the 400 years of silence. And in many ways, it's, that 400 years is added to the previous 400 years and even 200 years before that, where the people of Israel are in captivity. And when, hopefully in the spring or the summer or next fall, when I get a chance to have us meet together for a regular Bible study, I would love to start in the book of Matthew because Matthew has so many good things and such a basic ground-starting way of introducing you to what I know about the Bible. And one of the things that I know that is so true about that in a chart that I have shows the history of the Jewish people and it breaks it down into who has control of the Israelites at which time period. And it's almost like that through the time period there's people standing in line saying, I'm going to control the Israelites next. I will control their destiny. I want their land. And whether we can say that it's because it's God's promised land that we all want that or not, I can't say for sure, but I do know that conquering the Israelites has been the goal of many great nations over the ages. And in the time of Isaiah, the Persians are, are the, the ones that seem to be the ones that are in the control seat. And you can hear it in the first couple scriptures, the first three verses. It says, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down that the mountains would tremble before you, as when the fire sets the twigs ablaze and cause water to boil and come down and make your names known to your enemies and cause the nations to quake before you. For when you did awesome things that we did not expect, you came down and the mountains trembled before you. It's imploring to God that things are not good right now. It's beckoning that all they need is to have the God come down and, and do his mighty acts as they know he's done them before. That they are so weary as we are weary of the virus. They were weary of not being self-controlled in their, their government. They were tired of one country coming in after another and some of the countries don't even have names that we really recognize well that the people get so tired of that and they want to just be free. And we know in the time of Jesus, their expectation of their king, that they had great expectations and that their expectations were more physical, that they wanted to see a king sit on the throne of Jerusalem and minimize the the bad things, and maximize the good things. That once he comes, that, he, that they would be the ones that would be in the seat of control. And that was never truly what, what God had intended for his people. He intended for them to, to have their own lands, but that they should follow him, and, and they never quite figured that out. 
Their hopes were, are drained and their belief is at its lowest ebb. And at this point in their history, God has sent judges and prophets and angels and even a flood to correct what's wrong with his people, their lack of faith in the world. But nothing has worked out. What no one knows except the most faithful to God is that God has big plans and that hope should not be dead, that the biggest change in man's relationship to God is going to be made. Israel will not be made all-powerful. They will not get their mighty conqueror that they want. They will be asked to listen to one man and believe. But they will judge him and try him. So when he, we see this moment as one of the great hopes, God knows that this will be his greatest showing of strength. But it won't be seen that way by many. We know now that the key for that hope is to have hope ourselves in who he is, to understand who he is, and to believe that. In the context of this verse, as when it is written, it's during the time that the people are split apart, that there is the remnant that stayed behind, that are the people that are the poor and the, the, the needy, the ones that, that need to have the controls of the government and the controls of a, a benevolent leader. They're suffering because they're not having neither except the the marching through of the Persian army and, and the cruelty of the Persian empire. Meanwhile, the other half is taken away and to be added into their kingdom and not being allowed to do what they want to do the most, which is praise their God. The verse goes on in here and it says, Since ancient times no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on the behalf of those who waits for him. The writer is saying, we know how to be the people you need us to be. Just help us get to that point. It says here, you come and help those who gladly do right, who remember your ways, but when we continue to sin against them, you are angry. How can we be saved? It's recognizing the fact that God has sent prophet after prophet and that messenger after messenger, and at every point they've been plucked down and knocked down. And as we know, the story continues that God will send the greatest of the people that he has sent with his son. And they will sadly do the same to him. But yet hope springs eternal because in the verses that they know so well, they know the prophecy is coming true at some point in their future. That God, what he has promised in the words of the books that have come before, that there is the coming of a new ruler. Not the ruler of their land, but the ruler of their hearts. They don't see that, but only the most faithful will be able to understand what is going to happen next. These verses are like a prayer to God by the people that are powerless and under oppression. The prayer exhibits two main features. It's the advent of hope on one hand and a deep sense of desperation in a situation that's out of control in the other. A bold confidence in God is voiced and it's addressed to a God who can intervene if God will to make life peaceable and joyous. And that is just this verse. This verse is part of a greater section in Isaiah that talks about this lament of the people and how they're 
struggling to get by in this current situation that they're in. And when we go through this in verse 6, it says, All of us have become like one who is unclean. And all our righteous acts are like filthy rags, and we shrivel up like a leaf. It's recognizing that they are not worthy. And when you take this verse into context of what we are seeing today, often I hear that we are not worthy of what God has given us, and that somehow this virus is somehow a punishment on us. That somehow we've become as unworthy as the Jewish people of old. And worthy or unworthy, I'm going to speak the words to you that that is not the important thing. When people say that to me and say, we're getting what we deserved, and I'm thinking, I pray we don't get what we deserve. Because we deserve so much more bad than what we've gotten. But we live with a God that is being so very, very merciful to us. That like the Jewish people, we tend to go our own ways and do our own things, and we need to focus on Him more. So whether we deserve this virus or not is not the issue. The issue is, what do we do with this virus? Where does that take us with this virus? Is our prayers changing us in a way that we need to change? In verse 7 it says, No one calls on your name or strives to lay hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have given us over to your sins, our sins. That even though we're we're dealing with this, that somehow you are doing exactly what you need to do. And verse 8 says, has this word that it starts off with yet. And from this point, after the word yet, the, the feeling of the, the verses that I've read changes. Yet is the peak of this Verses that I've read, we've reached the, the climax, and it says, Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay. You are the potter, and we are all the works of your hand. And whether we're desired, whether we believe that we are deserving of this virus or not, we are still the the clay in the hands of the potter. And in our thoughts and in our misery and all the things that are keeping us where we are, we have this connection with the God who loves us beyond all measure. And this prayer that we connect with Him with, if we are focused on Him, and like I said, if we have the one thing be that one thing, then we will become what God needs us to be. We shouldn't lose faith in, the, in, the, in God because he has a greater thing coming for us. And it isn't just the birth of his son, but the promise that his son brings. That not only is the reality of, of the Christian walk going to change for us, but the fact that we can change our path, that we can choose to follow Jesus. It says finally in verse 9 that do not be angry beyond measure, Lord. Do not remember our sins forever. Oh, look on us, we pray, for we are all your people. This is where the advantage of us looking back on this verses 
become so much more to meaning to us than what it meant to them. Because they didn't have the words of comfort that we have from Jesus today. That Jesus telling his people that your sins will no longer be held against you. That the memory of your sins will be cast as far away as the east is from the west. And that you will not have to worry anymore about that because I have come to be that perfect sacrifice. We have that advantage of looking back that God has been faithful to those people by bringing a Savior, yet they reject Him. But He still has set up a plan that even in spite of their sin and our sin, that we are able to move on, that we can still have the confidence of the Savior in our lives. And whether we feel that the, the verses that the sins that we have in ourselves, no matter what they are, they are forgivable. That though we may deserve the evil that falls upon us, that God has hope for so much more than that. That we don't have to wallow in the, in the depravity of what's been going on with us. We go to the reality that there is only one God and all quake before God. Everything quakes before God. That He is not just our Abba and Father and our personal Savior, but He is all powerful and all will answer to Him in the end. So who is at fault, really? We want to blame ourselves for what is going on around us. And sometimes we want to blame God for what is going on around us. But there is no fault to be found. Only that hope in God and in Jesus and his giving of his life for us. So that means that when we pray with diligence that the illusion that we had read here in these verses that he is the potter and we are the clay and he will mold us. That if we keep that one thing, the one thing that we have hope in the fact that we will be changed to the people that God needs us to be. That if we see him, only him, in the good and the bad, that he will become what we need and we will become what he needs. But we have to have that single-minded looking towards God to do that. That belief in God that he is the one to do the right thing for us and that we just have to hold on. And like I said at last week that we've coming to the end of this tunnel, but it isn't quite there yet, that we just need to hold on. That the hope that we have today is the hope that will see us through to the end. That God will have a new thing and there will be a new day dawning. And like the sun comes up every morning, Something new will come of this. So please, as we go through this Advent season, keep that in mind that the, we need this Advent season. We need this time to replenish our hope, to polish off our faith and to practice the love that we know that you have for us and that we have for you. Dear Lord, be with us 
as we go through this season. Amen. Let's bow our heads. We are your people. We belong to you and you cannot disown us. We are as surely part of your family as your son, Jesus Christ, because he has said we are fellow sons and daughters of God. We are as sure to be under the umbrella of your love and protection as as anything else in the kingdom. And though Jesus had to go through the worst for us, that's so that we do not have to go through the worst for ourselves. I pray, dear Lord, that you be with us and that you fill us with the the joy of this season, that you in these coming weeks once again tear down all that we have lost hope over, that we can move on and be hopeful once again that this time of Advent will go away and we will soon be of renewed strength in the coming new year, that we can face 2021 with a renewed vigor in, in who Jesus Christ is in our lives. I thank you, dear Lord, for this reminder in the Advent season of your love and your joy and the hope that you will have for us. Thank you, dear Lord. Amen. This morning, I picked the song, Away in the Manger. And I think we have music to go along with this this morning. As soon as I find the the verse, the page here, go ahead. Away in a manger, no crib for a bed. The little Lord Jesus lay down his sweet head. The stars in the sky looked down where he lay. The little Lord Jesus asleep on the hay. The cattle are lowing, the baby awakes. The little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. I love the Lord Jesus, look down from the sky. And stay by my cradle till morning is nigh. Be near me, Lord Jesus, I ask thee to stay close by me forever, and love me, I pray. Bless all the dear children in thy tender care, and fit us for heaven to live with thee there. Thank you for being with us this morning. I pray that you continue to join us in the adventure of the Advent season as we come back next week and talk about faith. Now let's bow our heads. Dear Lord, I ask that you be with these people in all that they do and in their lives and their homes, their jobs and their businesses, that you just be with them and that they gain a new sense of hope in their lives that that if they have been washed asunder by all the despair of what's been going on around them, that you give them that hope that they need for this season, and that the hope that they have helps them see even greater things in you, that all of this is part of your coming kingdom, 
and we thank you for it. And I pray that you be with us and keep us well until we come back into your church next week. Amen. <coughs> Have a good week.